Hey guys, this is Landon from the Command Valley bringing to you another Monday EDH Deck Tech. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this week's episode. I'm super excited to have you guys here to be bringing you this deck tech on this wonderful new commander. Today's deck tech is going to be on Prosper the Tome Bound. Now Prosper is a brand new legendary creature that is going to be in the upcoming Adventures in the Forgotten Realm pre-constructed decks. Wizards of the Coast is giving us four brand new pre-constructed decks and Prosper is the face commander for the red black deck. Now just a quick disclaimer, I am recording this deck tech before the official deck list has been spoiled. So my deck, it could look really similar to the official pre-constructed deck. I have no idea. There's probably going to be cards in that list that will probably be auto includes in the Prosper deck, but I decided that I didn't want to wait for that list to come out before I recorded this deck tech because I am super excited about this commander and this deck tech will be going up on YouTube after the deck list is already spoiled. So just keep that in mind. I will not have seen the official pre-constructed list when I recorded this episode. Now let's go over Prosper. He is a legendary creature Typhling Warlock, super flavorful. I love all the D&D races making an appearance in Magic. He costs two a red and a black. He has Death Touch, he's a 1-4, and they've done something super cool with a lot of the legendary creatures in this set. They've given them flavor words that kind of describe their abilities. And honestly, I really like that flavor. So his first ability is called the Mystic Arcanum. At the beginning of your end step, you exile the top card of your library and until the end of your next next turn you can play that card. Now how it's worded you can play that card is really relevant to how this deck is going to be constructed. This is a super cool ability. Um, it's rather slow and I don't think a creature with that ability is necessarily good in the 99 but having a way of getting card advantage in the command zone every turn is super useful. Now his second ability is called Pact Boon and, when, and it triggers whenever you play a card from exile you will create a treasure token. So the way that is worded will trigger every time we play a land from exile. So if we play Prosper and at the end of our turn we exile a land with his ability, on our next turn we can play that land and Prosper will also make us a treasure that we can sacrifice for mana, which is super cool. I love that so much. I have been waiting a really long time for a Rakdos commander that provides both card advantage and ramp or acceleration and Prosper does it both and he does it really well and that triggers whenever we cast things from exile that we exile from our opponent's library so this deck is going to be loaded with ways of exiling cards from our library and our opponent's library so we can really take advantage of that pact boon ability. Now I don't know a ton about d and I've only played a couple of times but from what I understand Mystic Arcanum and Pact Boon both are abilities that Warlocks have in d and and I think that flavor is super cool and I, I kind of like that immersive feeling it kind of makes you feel a little bit more when you're reading the card you can you know kind of imagine in your head a Warlock using these abilities and I, I think that's cool. Now I've had a lot of preamble for this episode but let's get into the list. So I'm going to start with the mana acceleration. I will go over this rather quickly, but we really are trying to stick Prosper on turns three to four. We really wanna get him out as quick as possible. So I've included a decent amount of ramp here. So as for mana rocks, we've got Arcane Signet, Charcoal Diamond, Everflowing Chalice, Fire Diamond, Soul Ring, Talisman of Indulgence, and Wayfarer's Bauble. The great thing about our commander is he's going to be ramping us throughout the game as we play him, So we, but we really wanna make sure that that we have a mana rock and a couple of lands in our opening hand so we can get them out as quick as possible. Now we are playing some ramp in the form of instants and sorceries and creatures. We've got a dark ritual which is super good at getting our commander out really early. We've also got seething song which again on turn three if we've got our colors we can get our commander out. We've also got shorn or xorn. I'm not quite sure how that's supposed to be pronounced. I'm sorry for butchering it but he is an elemental for only three mana and if we would create one or more treasures we're going to create those treasures plus an additional treasure. So every time Packed Boon triggers from our commander, we are going to make another treasure if Shorn is out. So two treasures per Packed Boon trigger, really good. And we've got Bergy, God of Storytelling, which is kind of like Shorn, I guess, three mana. And every time we cast a spell, we make a red mana. So that can lead to some really fiery turns. 
Now let's just kind of get into the meat of the deck. And these are the cards that we have that help us exile cards from our library and our opponent's library. So let's start off with Gomti, Lord of Luxury. When he ETBs, we look at the top four cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down, and put the rest on the bottom of that player's library. We can look at and cast that card for as long as it remains exiled, and we can spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast that spell. So it's a really good ETB, it gets us cards from our opponent's library, and it will trigger our commander. We've also got Atali, Primal Storm, which is probably one of the stronger creatures in the deck. Every time Atali attacks, we exile the top card of each player's library, then we can cast any number of spells from among those cards without paying their mana cost. This is even better than Gaunti. We get three cards from our opponents if they're spells, and then we get three packed boon triggers, making a bunch of treasures. So this, this card swinging is going to net us three treasures, and that's a ton of ramp. Next up, let's go over Draugr Necromancer. If a non-token creature an opponent controls would die, we exile it with a ice counter on it instead. We can cast spells from among cards and exile our opponent's own with ice counters on them, and we can spend mana of any type cast them so this is simultaneously graveyard hate to card advantage to ramp and acceleration if we have our commander out it kind of does it all and four mana for a four four really cool plus the art on this is amazing Next up, we have Reverse Snapcaster with Dire Fleet Daredevil. It's a two mana, first striking human pirate, which when it ETBs, we exile target instant or sorcery card from an opponent's graveyard. We can cast that card this turn and we can spend mana of any color. If that card would be put into a graveyard this turn, it is exiled instead. So this is good being able to steal an opponent's spell from a graveyard, trigger a commander, great. Next up, we've got Keru Mind Eater. It is a menacing vampire and when it deals combat damage to a player, that player is going to exile a card from his or her hand face down. We can look at and play cards exiled with Keru Mind Eater. Now, as we go through this list and we start and we're talking about cards you'll notice that some of these cards have different wordings than one another anytime it says cast like atali or gonti it means that we cannot play lands this might seem kind of obvious for players who've been playing for a while but it is something that at least tripped me up when i was learning how to play and i think it's a good it's a good thing to point out so keru mind eater letting us play the cards exiled with its ability will let us play lands and i think playing lands with our commander out is honestly the best because playing down a land and getting a treasure it's like doubling mana which is really powerful we then have stromkirk occultist which is a very similar to care mind eater when it does combat damage to a player we exile the top card of their library and until end of turn we can play that card it's not going to let us spend mana of any type to cast it, but our commander makes us treasures which can, which can you know, generate mana of any color, so that's not a huge issue. We've also got a really powerful sorcery in Praetor's Grasp, which lets us search target opponent's library for any card, exiling it face down. Then that player's going to shuffle, and we can look at and play that card for as long as it remains exiled. This is such a powerful card, and for the longest time, it really wasn't that expensive, but people have kind of caught on to how good this card is. So... If you have a friend in your playgroup that has like a really degenerate combo deck and it's a really annoying to deal with, you can use Praetor's Grasp to search their library and take out their Thassa's Oracle or take out their food chain or take out their combo piece and it's really going to hinder their deck. And sometimes Praetor's Grasp is actually the silver bullet that just makes it so your opponent's deck doesn't work. But you can use it for anything. You can use it for grabbing a land if you need it or, you know, grabbing a piece of removal or a counter spell. Just the flexibility on Praetor's Grasp is, is amazing. So it's, and it has synergy with our commander. And we've got a couple more ways to exile cards from our opponent's library specifically. We've got Cunning Rhetoric, which is honestly one of my personal favorite cards that was printed this year. Whenever an opponent attacks you or one or more Planeswalkers you control, you are going to exile the top card of that player's library. And we can play that card for as long as it remains exiled and we can spend mana of any color. So our opponents are going to have to make that decision every time they attack us. It just risks us taking more good cards from them and getting more treasure with our commander. And then we've got Stolen Strategy, which at the beginning of our upkeep, we exile the top card of each opponent's library. And until the end of turn, we can cast non-man cards from among the exiled cards and we can spend mana of any color. So at the beginning of our turn, getting to theoretically draw three cards and deny those three cards from our opponents, super powerful enchantment, although it is a little bit expensive mana-wise. So in addition to having ways of exiling cards from our opponent's library, we've got lots of ways of exiling cards from our library. So let's start off with Abbot of Carol Keep. When it ETBs, exile the top card of our library and until the end of turn, we can play it. Dark Dweller Oracle has a very similar ability, but instead of triggering on ETB, we can sacrifice a creature and pay one mana to exile the top card of our library and we can play it this turn. We've got Dream Devour, which is really interesting in this deck. Each non-land card in our hand without foretell gets foretell and its foretell cost is equal to its mana cost reduced by two generic mana. So we can pay two mana to exile a card from our hand face down. And then on a later turn, we can play that spell 
still respecting the timing restrictions for that card. And when we do so, the cost is reduced by two generic mana. Now, this is really cool for our commander because our commander's Pact Boon ability will trigger when we cast foretelled cards. And they're going to be nice and safe out of our hand. So if our opponents wheel or if they have some type of hand disruption, they're going to be foretold. And even if Dream Devourer leaves the battlefield, we can still cast those cards from foretell. So I really like Dream Devourer in this deck. We then have Lelia, the Blade Reforged. She has haste. And whenever she attacks, we exile the top card of our library and we can play it until the end of turn. And whenever we exile one or more cards from our library, and or graveyard we get to put a plus one plus one counter on Lelia. This is a super powerful ability She's going to get huge really quickly and being able to swing the turn she comes out and get us some value I really like that in this deck. We then have magmatic channeler who has an activated ability that lets us tap her to discard a card We exile the top two cards of our library and then we can choose one of them and we can play that card this turn Following the channeler, we have Tectonic Giant, and whenever it attacks or becomes a target of a spell an opponent controls, we choose one of the following. We can have it deal three damage to each opponent, or we exile the top two cards of our library, we choose one of them, and until the end of our next turn, we can play that card. We then have Tuscary Firewalker, which has a really cool boast ability, so as long as it's attacked, we can pay one generic mana and exile the top card of our library, and we can play that card this turn. Now, a lot of these effects individually or on their own, by themselves, however you want to say it, probably aren't super impactful but if we can get two or three of these on the battlefield in addition to our commander we are going to be churning through cards in our deck and we're going to have lots of card advantage now we do have a couple more ways in our instants and sorceries of exiling cards from our library but i would like to kind of talk about our win cons right now now that we kind of have a general picture on what the deck is trying to accomplish and how the wheels start to turn now, what we know about our commander is two things. The first thing is it he gives us access to card advantage in exiling the top card of our library and letting us play it. And the deck so far has been built in such a way that we are exiling more cards from our library and our opponent's library. The second part of our commander's ability is giving us treasure. So we are always going to be ramping throughout the game. So being able to have access to a ton of mana gives us a really good win con in Torment of Hellfire. I know that is a super generic win con and it goes in a lot of decks and it is kind of a pricey card but I feel like it does have synergy in this deck. Being able to spend all of our treasures on a big X spell, I think is a super valid strategy for this deck. So if you're unfamiliar with Torment of Hellfire, it's X black black. We repeat the following process X times. Each opponent loses three life unless that player sacrifices a non-land permanent or discards a card. If we can put 15 to 20 mana into this, which in my testing of this deck isn't super difficult, it's just going to end the game. Our opponents are going to have to sacrifice so many things or take so much damage to the point where they're just not gonna be able to come back from that, especially given how much value our deck can produce. In addition to playing Torment of Hellfire, we are also playing another really good X burn spell, quote unquote, and that is cut to ribbons. It is the, one of the split cards from Amonkhet, which means we cast one side from our hand and the other side we have to cast from our graveyard. So the first part of it, cut, can deal four damage to target creature. And then the ribbons we is X black black and each opponent is going to lose X life. So this is similar to Torment of Hellfire, except for our opponents are just going to lose the life. They don't have a choice of discarding a card or sacrificing a non-man permanent. And if we can you know, generate a ton of mana, use some of our treasures, this can close out the game. The the second win con in this deck leans really heavily into the treasure tokens in a different way than Torment of Hellfire does, and that is Revel and Riches. And let me say, I have been waiting a long time to find a really good home for this card. Whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, we are going to make a treasure token. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if we control 10 or more treasures, we just win the game. I think it's actually a really viable win con for this deck. And the final win con in this deck is Combo. I know not everybody uh, enjoys infinite combos and how quickly they can end the game. And it's for that reason that I haven't put very many tutors in this deck. Um, you're just gonna have to like hopefully draw into it. And there is that risk where Prosper Exile is one of the win cons and you're not able to actually combo off that turn because you don't have the other piece. So I feel like it's kind of fair. And the first part of it is Dual Caster Mage and the second half of the combo is Twin Flame or Heat Shimmer. Dual Caster Mage and either of these sorceries will have a net result of infinite Dual Caster Mages with haste and that will just end the game. So if the game goes long, things go south, Torment got countered, Revel and Riches got blown up, and you need like some type of backup and the game just needs to get over, this can do it for you. 
Okay, now let's go over the final ways we have in the deck of exiling cards from our own library and getting some more value. Now these exile cards are just strictly value. So, all right, the first card in this list is Commune with Lava. This is a spell that I had actually never played before. It's an instant for X red red. We exile the top X cards of our library and until the end of our next turn, we can play those cards. We then have Apex of Power, which is a massive 10 mana spell, seven red, red, red. We exile the top seven cards of our library and until the end of turn, we can cast spells from among them. And if the spell is cast from our hand, we are going to add, we're going to add 10 mana of any one color to our mana pool. We're gonna be making a bunch of treasures and we've got other ways of ramping in this deck. We could easily power out an Apex of Power from our hand, exile a bunch of cards. And if we live the dream, Torment of Hellfire will be among them and we can cast a massive Torment of Hellfire, but super, super cool card. We then have Galvan relay which exiles the top card of our library and during our next turn we can play that card and it has storm which is super cool we then have one of my pet cards with ignite the future we exile the top three cards of our library and until the end of our next turn we can play those cards if this spell was cast from a graveyard you may play cards this way without paying their mana costs and it has a flashback of seven in a red i love this card so much it's done so much work for me in my cast deck will it do as much work in prosper i don't know but we're making a lot of treasures and we've got ways of making a bunch of mana Eight mana to cast it from our graveyard to cast the top three cards of our library out paying their mana cost could be super worth it. So I like it in this deck. We also have Jessica's Will, which is a little bit pricey, but I think it's too good to not include here. We get to choose one of the following modes. And if we control a commander as we cast this spell, we can choose both. First option is adding a red to our mana pool for each card and target opponent's hand. And the second mode is exile the top three cards of our library and we can play them this turn. We then have a light at the stage, which has a spectacle cost of one red mana. So we can cast it for one red mana if an opponent has lost life this turn. We exile the top two cards of the library and until the end of our next turn, we can play those cards. We then have Throws of Chaos, which is a super interesting spell. It has Cascade. So when we cast this spell, we exile cards from the top of our library until we exile a non-land card that costs less than four mana. We can cast the exile card without paying its mana cost and the rest of the cards will go on the bottom of our library in a random order. Now, Cascade does trigger our commander because we will be casting a spell from exile. Now, Throws of Chaos also has Retrace, so we can cast this card from our graveyard by discarding the land card in addition to paying the four mana it costs to play the spell. So this is a repeatable Cascade spell that is constantly and going to each and every time give us uh, instant or sorcery or any type of card that costs three mana, and it's always going to trigger our commander's Pact of ability. So I think that's super cool. We then have Valica Exploration, which is a super good enchantment that has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under our control, we are going to exile the top card of our library and we can play that card for as long as it remains exiled. At the beginning of our end step, if there are cards exiled with Velika Exploration, we put them into their owner's graveyard, then Velika Exploration deals that much damage to each opponent. Now it's unlikely that we're going to be triggering Velika Exploration several times in a turn as this deck doesn't really have ways of putting multiple lands into play in any given turn, but being able to being able to trigger every time we play a land, which hopefully is every turn with how many cards you're gonna be exiling from our libraries and our opponent's library. And just having that extra card advantage is really going to add up. Now we're getting towards the end of the deck tech here and I've got a couple more cards I would like to talk about that didn't fit into any of these categories super well. The first is Consuming Vapors. Now this has Rebound, which we cast it from our hand. We're going to exile it as it resolves. And at the beginning of our next upkeep, we can cast this card without paying its mana cost from exile, which triggers our commander. And it reads, target player sacrifices a creature and we will gain life equal to that creature's toughness. Now, I know this isn't probably the most powerful spell. Our opponent is just going to choose the creature they have uh, that has the least toughness. So we get the least amount of benefit from it. But at only being four mana, if we get our commander out on turn three, and then we can curve into this on turn four and our opponents are just barely casting their commanders and they don't have anything else in play, then they're going to be forced to sacrifice their commanders. And honestly, that happens a lot in my play group. So I think that this spell is worth it. We then have creative technique, which has the demonstrate mechanic, which came out in Strixhaven. When we cast this spell, we can choose to copy it. If we do, an opponent also gets to copy it. This lets us shuffle our library, then reveal cards from the top of our library until we reveal a non-land card. We will exile that card and put it the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order. And then we can cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. 
But for five mana, we can shuffle our library and then exile until we find an element card and we can cast it for free. And if we use the demonstrate ability, we get a second iteration of it at the cost of letting our opponent also get an iteration of this effect. Our deck is uniquely suited to benefit the most from this ability, so I think it is definitely worth it. And so the final category in this deck is just our tutors and other card draw that didn't really fall into the exile category. So we've got a dark petition, which I think is a really good budget tutor and it is just really good. We can search our library for any card, put it into our hand, shuffle. And if we have spell mastery, meaning there are two or more instant or sorcery cards in our graveyard, we also get to cast a dark ritual, adding three black mana to our mana pool. Super great. We've also got a Diabolic Tutor, four mana, search our library for any card, put it into our hand, no questions asked. And then Faithless Looting, we've got in here too, not really a tutor, just a good, uh, a good looting effect, draw two cards, discard two cards, we can flash it back if we need to, really useful. And then I'm throwing in a new card from the upcoming D&D set, you find some prisoners. At instant speed, we get to choose one. Break their chains, destroy target artifact, or investigate them. Exile the top three cards of target opponent's library. Choose one of them until the end of your next turn. We can play that card, and we can spend mana of any color to cast it. Really nice instant speed, two mana, belongs in the deck. A large portion of this deck is actually interaction. We're playing a ton of spot removal in this deck, and that's because our commander lets us exile cards from the top of our library, and we can play them until the end of our next turn. So it kind of makes sense to have a lot of instant speed interaction. Being able to hold up interaction and maybe even threaten interaction, our opponents are going to have to think of think twice about you know casting their commander or, or casting a powerful creature when they can see very clearly that we are holding up a terminate or a dread boar or a go for the throat or they're going to think twice about you know deploying you know a bunch of creatures if we've got a chain reaction or you know a blasphemous act exiled with our commander so i really like kind of having that threat of interaction and i'm not going to go over every single piece of targeted removal or board wipe in this deck you can find that in the deck list and i'm opting not to talk about it because it's going to change depending on the meta that you're in a lot of metas, you don't really necessarily need to have that much spot removal for creatures. Maybe you're in a creature light meta. Personally, I'm in a creature heavy meta. So for me, this is the, the deck how I would build it, playing it in my personal meta. And these are the cards that I would include. So I know that this is kind of a flex spot. So I, I don't want to put it into your head that these are the best spells that you need to be playing when it comes to interaction. So you can just kind of find that down in my deck list. And with that, this episode is coming to a close. Thank you guys so much for tuning into these, this week's episode. I hope you are as excited about Prosper as I am. I've been waiting a long time for a commander like this to come out. I am definitely building the crap out of this deck. It looks awesome. And it's one of those decks that's going to continuously get, be getting better. Seems like Wizards is really leaning into red having that impulse type. You can play this card from Exile till the end of your next turn. And that's just every single time one of those cards get printed, Prosper just gets better and better. At this point, I would like to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons and all of our subscribers. We really couldn't do this without you guys. We love you. You guys mean the world to us and we hope you continue to enjoy our content. And if you are interested in becoming a patron, you can do so by heading on over to patreon.com slash command value to sign up today. You get access to special channels in our discord. You get merch. We send you guys cards. You can play games with us. It's just a ton of fun and our patrons are awesome and we've got a super great community over on our discord. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, but you're interested in seeing all of the deck tags that we release every Monday and the gameplay videos that we release every month, you should definitely hit that subscribe button so you stay up to date on all of our content. Again, we'd just like to give a huge thank you to everybody that watches our episodes and subscribes to our channel and all of our patrons. And I hope you guys have a wonderful week.